Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, I think this is our first Eng talk of this year, but certainly our most impressive college accomplishment of the year. Uh, we've had this re-engineered first year program going now for two full years, and the vision started before I arrived, so more than five years ago. Um, the idea here was to say, you know, first year engineering isn't really working great for anybody, and it hasn't worked great for anybody for about 40 years. And we just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and somehow people survive. So we think, oh, it can't be that bad. But actually, we think it could be a lot better. So when I started as a faculty member back in 1992, we actually knew almost nothing about how to teach engineering well. We knew lots about what we needed to teach, but not a lot about how to do it in a way that would be memorable, impactful, even effective. And since then, we have learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. But what I've asked Sean to talk about today, and I know he'll do a great job because I've seen him do it at major universities across the country. Well, I only saw one, but I know that he's done it well at other places. And he is the keynote speaker for Queens's Teaching Development Day later this month. Um, so yeah, Kevin Deluzio is a fan. He's also a friend of mine. But um, it's how does competency-based assessment work? Because it's a different way of thinking about university learning and testing. And it's a different way to think about how to build great engineers. The other thing it is, is it's the way that professional engineering regulators have moved in their certification of new engineers. So they're no longer doing the, give me a letter from your supervisor and we'll believe it's okay. They're actually doing competency-based assessment. So it sets our students up for what they're gonna see down the road. Um, I think it's a really exciting way to do education in a better way. It's also a little bit of work to get your mind around, but most good things require a little bit of work to get used to. Um, Sean is one of our great faculty members. He came to us from Mount Royal in Calgary, where he had lots of experience with their first year program. So Sean's a great member of the college. He's a passionate instructor, and he actually does his homework and doesn't just get excited about it. He does it in a really grounded way. So Sean, thanks for agreeing to spend some of your time with us today. I will give you the microphone. Thank you very much, Suzanne. That's very kind of you. And uh, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about the first year program and competency-based assessment. That'll be one of the main things we talk about, but it's an introduction to the first year program with an emphasis on the assessment system. Before we get going on that though, we are going to see if we can actually get movement on the slides. And they don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. I would like to begin by pointing out that in the spirit of reconciliation, we are on unceded territory, Treaty 6 territory to be specific, of the Cree, Soto, Stony, uh, Nakota, Dakota, and Lakota, as well as the homeland of the Métis. And we pay respects to, to these First Nations and Métis ancestors that uh, were on this land and continue to live here to build our relationships with them. And that's actually important for what we're gonna talk about tonight because we are working more indigenous content into the first year program. And I'm gonna to speak to that a little bit as we, we go forward. So the goals of this presentation are by the end of today, hey Mike, by the end of today, you should be able to recognize the major features of our program and appreciate why those features are there. Um, that's my goal this evening, and there'll be an emphasis on the competency-based assessment. So when, uh, when we sat down to plan this about, I don't know, five or six years ago now, 
uh, Joel Fry, who's in the audience here today. He and I were uh, partners in crime in this uh, in the early days and continue to be today. Uh, we came up with a program vision and mission, and that has held true since then. And, you know, this is what we aspire to. That's what a vision is, an aspiration. And we truly aspire for this to be the most effective first year program in Canadian engineering. And we're getting a lot of attention now across the country as people recognize that there's something special here. We want to excite, engage, and inspire our students, and that's what we're shooting for. And you know, we, we are trying to prepare our students for success in second year and beyond, um, and even in other areas if they leave engineering. So uh, we, we're trying to take a broad picture. Now, these are the features that we're going to talk about tonight. These are some of the key features of the new first year program. Uh, we will have a special emphasis on competency based assessment because that's the one that's um, perhaps the most radical change. And uh, it's the one that needs the most explaining, as Dean Cresta suggested in her introductory remarks. So we'll start by looking at the, the schedule for the year. And this is the 2022-2023 schedule. Um, it is changing a little bit from year to year as we get better at doing this, but this is not what a regular uh, year at university looks like. You might take four or five, six courses, they run the whole term, each term, that's it. But you can see here, it's definitely a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have courses that only run for half a term or less. Uh, we have certain sequences of courses, and we have more variety of courses that would be in, than would be in a typical first year. We also don't have final exams. Now, we'll expand upon that a little later, but we, we do have lots of testing. I, I want to be clear about that, <laughs> arguably more than in a conventional first year, but we don't have final exams. Instead, we have in the fall term, um, an experience of going into each engineering discipline, each of five engineering disciplines for a whole day each. And that's been really popular with the students to see which type of engineering they're most interested in. And then in the second term, it's a bridge to going into their chosen disciplines because the students will know by then where they're going, which is also a big change. And so we have a, a second design course and a bridge course. And that bridge course gets them ready for the discipline they're going into. And that's had radical impact on a number of disciplines. And we're going to talk about how soon. But you can see, for example, that they learn MATLAB programming and Python. There's drawing and sketching in CAD. We have math throughout. Math runs through it. Um, we have natural sciences, chemistry, um, electromagnetism and waves, circuits. We also have mechanics, an introduction to the profession, design. There's a lot of things going on. And we're going to look at some of those details uh, in a moment. One of the other things that is quite different, and we've also gotten a lot of positive feedback from the students on this, is a consistent weekly schedule. Now, what's good about the consistent weekly schedule is that we have regular lunch times for everybody. So all the first years have lunch together. And that facilitates a number of positive social things. Um, notice that we only go to 3.30 or 4 on uh, each day. What that means is if you're a Husky athlete or a parent or you have a part-time job, you can make that work for you. So this uh, schedule can work for a broader cross-section of students. The only uh, real downside that we, we do get some feedback on, and I'm very sympathetic to this, is an 8.30 a.m. start every day. Not a personal fan of early mornings, but uh, well, you gotta, you gotta pay somewhere. Uh, the, the other thing is that we have a maximum of two lectures or labs in a row uh, before there's a, a break of lunch or a tutorial. So this consistency in the schedule, and there are the occasional spares that will pop up from time to time, uh, makes things very predictable. And it also allows students, again, to form a community and get to know each other, which does not typically happen. Otherwise, we get a lot of uh, feedback from students that they, uh, they feel sorry for their arts and science colleagues who, who have to make up their own schedule, which can be quite daunting and intimidating, especially in first year. Which gets us to the idea of block registration. So 
It used to be when you signed up for engineering for first, first year engineering, you'd sign up for each of your courses and labs and you have to make sure everything fits and blah, blah, blah. It was very complicated. And now you just sign up for a block and all your, all your courses are here. And you're gonna be in that block with uh, 95 other students. And um, we'll, we work in groups of approximately 300, 100 or 50. It's actually multiples of 48, but we won't worry about that for a moment. And, and so you get to know your classmates. Everybody still has common lunches. So uh, there's a lot of positives to this block registration. Um, and it really takes a lot of stress off the students coming in. Now, I hesitate to say this, but since our Dean mentioned or intimated this in the introduction, I'm gonna go there. Um, before this new first year, there was effectively no real coordination of the first year courses. Like they, they didn't talk to each other. And actually now that we do talk to each other, it, it takes a lot of time and energy, but it's worth it. But that effort, it, it's effort, it's time. And you can kind of see maybe why there wasn't a lot of that before, but there is now, and it's very valuable. <clears throat> Our first year team, Joel and I, and other members of the first core first year team, we meet every week. We also meet every other week with our arts and science colleagues who are teaching courses in the curriculum as well. And what does that allow us to do? It allows us to pivot and be responsive if things are happening. We see problems as they're arising and we can do something about them. And we have over the last two years has been very valuable. Um, we can anticipate problems. We can react in a, in a quick manner. It's really been um, part of the special sauce that makes this program work. Now, the other aspect of the coordination of courses that's important is the sequencing of the courses and of the content between the courses. Basically, students learn what they need to know when they need to know it. And, and we've built the program that way. It's uh, a little bit complicated, but it can um, work out very well for the students. And I wanna highlight a couple of examples of that. So for example, in math, they will learn some basic calculus some integration before the dynamics course, because the dynamics course starts off with some integration. That didn't used to happen, I hesitate to say, uh, but now it does. <clears throat> design and technical communications work together because in design, we engage in technical communication. So people like Del Rolfas and others, uh, we work with them to make sure our curriculum is in sync and helping each other. In MATLAB, we're gonna learn some programming and routines that are gonna get used in circuits so that they can analyze some circuits using MATLAB. Drawing and sketching is a springboard to doing CAD in the following term. Um, in math, statics, and physics, you know, we've had our, our rough spots on this, but we are trying to coordinate so that knowing about dot products and cross products work for all three courses. And in a perfect world, uh, you know, math is introducing it, we're picking it up, and then physics, uh, they're seeing it in physics as well, and they sort of see it from three different perspectives, but it reinforces each other. And we are getting better at that. Um, to say, you know, we've had some growing pains in the past two years, but we're working to work through them. Um, also, we have a research course, which is pretty cool. And TechCom, one of the other TechCom courses, emphasizes poster presentations. And that dovetails perfectly with the research course where we finish with poster presentations. And some of those posters have been as good as fourth year students or grad students. Like it's been really encouraging to see some of the high quality stuff that the first year has been doing. Another aspect of the program, which uh, is new here. Uh, I mean, you know, it does happen in some other universities as well, but it's certainly uh, something we've, we've adopted into our program is to make sure we have tutorial support all the time for our students. And we'll actually have TAs that are specialized for different courses coming in on different nights, times to coordinate with assignments and tests and that sort of thing. These are optional, they're in here. <laughs> it's not usually as warm as it is today. I uh, should note they have air conditioning the rest of the year. Um, and, and basically those tutorials um, help people who need help. And so we, we try to support the students uh, as best we can. Some students just come into work 
And then they can ask the TAs if they need some help. Now, I mentioned that uh, we have some indigenous content in our new first year. And that begins in the introduction to engineering course, GE 102. And actually, um, Dean Cresta and Joel Fry have been responsible for building that course and that material. And what that does in terms of activities that are focused on reconciliation, um, on power and privilege, and on learning about Indigenous culture, it sets us up so that in other courses, we can start talking about examples. So for example, in design, we will talk about the different watercraft across Canada from Indigenous uh, First Nations and all the brilliant design features of those different watercrafts suited to their environment, built from materials in their environment. Um, in mechanics, we can talk about a travois, which is you know, essentially a couple of, of logs and a couple of uh, crossbars that can be used almost like a wheelbarrow to carry materials. Those long spars, by the way, come from a teepee. We have a teepee building exercise outside, which you may have noticed outside the building here. So it sets us up with sort of a cultural uh, contextualization of indigenous culture that we can then bring into other courses. And this is very important uh, in terms of, again, building our relationships with the First Nations of this land. Now, one of the other things, um, to be honest, this was actually one of the motivating factors, uh, if I must be honest, to, to start developing the new first year was about employable skills for first year students. By the end of first year, what have you got that you can go out there and say, I can, I can do something for you. And we did not have any programming in first year, which we were, I think, one of two or three programs in Canada, engineering programs that did not. Now, some students, the students who want and need it, can get two or three in first year, but everybody gets at least sort of one and a half. And so coming out of first year, our, our students have a nice suite of skills. Programming in Python and MATLAB, drawing and sketching in AutoCAD. And by the way, the green is new stuff in the new first year. Um, in black text, that would be what was in the previous first year, it's still here, but in the green is new. And so we have drawing and sketching, also AutoCAD, some safety training, some spreadsheets and statistics. Engineering design and tech comm are definitely still here and strong. We have an experimental research course. If you're in mechanical engineering in the bridge course in April, you're learning SolidWorks. And if you are in electrical or computer engineering or engineering physics, you are getting more advanced Python training. And this has changed everything for um, at least the electrical and computer engineering department. And I'm gonna bet because we have the department chair from physics here that it's also helped the, uh, the engineering physics people a lot because now they can do more things in second year having those programming skills. It's changed the whole curriculum for electrical and computer engineering. And from mechanicals perspective, it cleans up some loose ends at the end of first year that makes a clean start for second year, whereas they had the Jimmy in sort of weird things in different courses. Now they can kind of bottle them all up and, and do them in April. And, and then they have a clear path forward going into second year. Um, chemical engineers, they actually get uh, a chance to do real chemical engineering um, in their bridge course, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Exposure to options. This was another big theme that we wanted to emphasize in the first year. And uh, we think we're doing a good job of it because the feedback from students has been really positive on this part, on this point. So we want to help the students make good decisions about what they want to do in second year and beyond. Um, we have a couple of potential students in the room here tonight. Uh, I know at least one of them is not sure what uh, area they may want to go into. That's normal. And the question is, how are you going to figure it out? Well, one of the best things would be to have some experiences in those different areas. Now, it used to be we had a 15 minute uh, pitch and for each of them. And, you know, that was fun. But, you know, depending on who was giving the pitch, that was a big influencer. And 
15 minutes isn't really a lot of information to go on. So now we've got whole courses that are focused on different areas and they get to spend a whole day in each of uh, five different engineering areas. But they also get to see a selection of short courses in the natural sciences and a longer course in computer science in the fall. What's the difference between geology and ge geological engineering, between chemistry and chemical engineering, between physics and engineering physics? These are important questions for first year students to figure out. And we would much rather have students leave engineering and go into one of those related areas, if that's what's really the right thing for them. We'd love that to happen in first year or coming out of first year, not in second or third year, which is when it often happens in other programs. Um, the sophomore slump, as it were. So this helps a lot. And we also have engineering design twice, once in the first term, once in the second. That gets students excited about the engineering design aspects, uh, keeps them interested in the engineering side, even while they are taking courses that aren't engineering but are related to engineering. We have specific coursework in civil and mechanical, in process engineering and electrical engineering. So they are, students are getting exposure uh, throughout the two terms to the different major areas. And then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, G122, that week at the end of December, where you get to be in five different uh, engineering disciplines for a day long each, instead of exams. And uh, that has been a really life-changing course for a lot of students. We've gotten lots of great feedback on that course because it's helped them so much. It either confirms a decision they made or they go, oh, I was thinking of this, but over here, wow, this is really great. I'm really interested in this now. Um, it has really helped guide the decision-making for a lot of students. And, and for that, we are very, very happy. And all that is as a precursor to making choices about second year, uh, which those decisions are made before April. So that in April, you are actually taking courses that are for your new discipline. So, we're neither a total general, general engineering course in first year, nor are we streamed initially in first year. We're a hybrid, and that hybrid has worked out quite well. Which brings us to bridge courses. That's the April courses. So in April, instead of exams, uh, the students are going to be taking these, quote, bridge courses. And this is to help them get ready for their, their chosen new major. Now, if uh, you're going to civil, geo, or environmental engineering, what that is, is survey camp, which used to be in May-ish, May, June. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. Weather's nice in May. But it kind of screws up your summer for employment. Now they're doing that in the last two or three weeks of April, and they have the whole summer to get that summer job. And uh, each of the, last year and this year, they've each had a day of snow. But, you know, whatever, <laughs> you gotta, gotta tough it out. This is Saskatchewan, <laughs> it's not Vancouver. Um, so uh, the electrical, computer and engineering physics folks, they're gonna take a second design course and a second Python course. And in terms of design, you can see that is not a wall that fell down over there. That is a robotic maze. And Joel's actually helping teach that course right now, the design two course for electrical and computer engineering. Uh, they're doing robotics um, in a, in for engineering physics and students who want to do a multidisciplinary project. They're doing model rocketry right now, uh, launching a couple of rockets, making some design changes to the rockets. That's been quite popular. And so they're also picking up more Python, which gives them greater programming abilities, which gives them more options for things to do and elect electives they can take in second and third year. In chem biological, they're also taking that design two course. They're working on a chemical engineering oriented project. And they're also taking ChemEng 113, which is a true first chemical engineering uh, course. And that's helping them get ready for second year in chemical engineering. And then finally, uh, mechanical. Uh, they are also taking design, design two and a mechanical engineering course, as I had mentioned before which is a collection of things. They learn SOLIDWORKS, which is another CAD package on top of AutoCAD. So now they've got some extra skills, employable skills, skills that can help them with student design teams, for example. 
uh, but they're also picking up bits and pieces that are mechanics related content that not everybody else needed. Um, you know, electrical engineers only need so much mechanics. Okay, fine. The mechanical engineers can pick up the extra stuff here. And that's worked out quite well for them. The other thing, one of the other things that has been nice about this new first year is more labs. So we're trying to get more hands-on learning experiences in the new first year program. The green is new. The black text is stuff that's been there before. But as you can see in the four short natural uh, science courses in the fall, they each get some hands-on hands -on experiences there. In the indigenization module in GE 102, there's hands-on activities. Circuits too, they're making circuits, testing them out, uh, simulations. Uh, we have a lot of activities in design one and two. Sketching and CAD. Now in class, it's not a lab situation in class, but they have access to 3D printers outside of class. So there are lab activities there. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, we have dynamics and statics lab. We used to have those, we still do, but they're better. Uh, we've got new labs that are doing cool new things. And we got new kits. Some of them are at the back of this room. You can take a look at them afterwards. The research module. We have first year students doing honest research. I mean, it's not the hardest research in the world, but we're, we're giving first year's data sets and coaching them on research questions. And they are doing some honest analysis and uh, ex exploration. And we've actually hired some first year students after first year because they've done such a good job to keep doing what they're doing. Process engineering has labs. That is a, it's not just chemical engineering, but it is an en route into chemical engineering. So we have labs there. And of course, in physics and chemistry, we have lots of labs as well. Summer top ups. I've left the first thing to last. Summer top ups is before you even get here. Before September 1st, we have something to help. We want to help students make sure they're ready to go for September 1st. And, you know, it was not easy launching this program. This is the biggest understatement I will say today. It was not easy launching this program in the middle of COVID. <laughs> but the competency based assessment and these summer top ups saved a lot of students. And these were um, sort of self check mini courses, if you will, they're not really courses. They're more like, um, well, they're like tests. They're ways of testing yourself. Do I know what I'm doing in math, chemistry, physics, uh, those sorts of areas. And it's on an automated system. Um, so you go online and you're fill, answering questions and you get feedback. If you get them wrong, you get some helpful responses. You get to try again, you have unlimited tries. But it's, it's, it serves two purposes. It's going to reassure students if they're getting it all and going, oh, this is easy. I'm ready. Or, oh, I'm doing well, or oh, I haven't seen this before. And then you're going to get some help on getting through that material. And it helps fill in the gaps. So that everybody comes into first year at a certain sort of common minimum level across the board. Because we were all over the place before that. And now with these uh, top ups, uh, summer top ups rather, uh, it helps in that area. And just this past year to show you that we are adapting as we go, we added a computer science one. It is optional, uh, but the experience with it has been quite favorable. If you've never done computer science, we provide the resources so that you can take sort of a prep course, get, get going. And then when you go into the MATLAB course and the Python course, you're going to be okay. Uh, when we ran the first year of the new first year, we had some growing pains around that. So this is helping out a lot already. They are available July 1st, and they're generally expected to be done by September 1st, but typically they're due by the time you start the course they're associated with. So, um, you know, when the math course begins, this one actually has till January when the first major chemistry course begins. Uh, mechanics course, the, the dynamics. The G102, um, the computer science 142 course, and, and the techcom courses. So there are, these are essentially assignment zero for these courses in the fall and winter. Extracurricular activities. With a common lunchtime every day, 
it creates opportunities that I've been waiting for for several years here, which is we can do stuff with our first years. We could you know, get speakers in and students could actually show up. Uh, we could have clubs. They can go down to the Hardy Lab and work on you know a rocket or a plane or a car in, in the Hardy Lab. Um, they can do sports together. We in the fall, I, I have a, a soccer group that we go out and play. Um, they, they've been playing chess lately here. Uh, as I said, we can bring in speakers. We have contests. We had a, a MATLAB programming contest this term. We can show movies and other things. Like the students can take some leadership roles there to pick what they want to do. Now, the last major feature is the one that some of you are here for today. <laughs> competency-based assessment. It is the biggest and most radical change that is in our program. Um, as, as Suzanne was saying, uh, this is a, a big and important change. It is once you, once you drink the Kool-Aid, it's like, yeah, this is definitely the way to go. It's not a free ride. Uh, this is, it's, challenging to implement and there are hiccups along the way we're working on them but it makes a lot of sense and tonight i want to try and explain it to you it is not easy to explain but i'm going to give it my best shot and hopefully by tonight you will leave and you go i understand this competency business assessment business and i like it i mean that's my goal i want you to like it you you can just not like it if you want but <laughs> but I, I, we think it's a good way to go and it ties into a pedagogical philosophy that once you learn it, it just blows your mind as a teacher. I, I only became aware of it about five years ago. It's called constructive alignment. And it just changes your whole perspective on teaching. I wish I had known about this 20 years ago. And we still have, you know, there's still a lot of professors in this university and this college who aren't really aware of it. We got to change that. But it changes how you view, view teaching. And we're trying to do this here. So, as I said, it's a key feature of the re-engineered first year program, but what is it? What is competency-based assessment? And that is not an easy question to answer because the literature is not very great on this topic. There is a literature on what's called competency-based education or competency-based learning, mostly in medicine. Uh, medicine is where most of the activity has been and, and sort of the literature has been written. It's a pedagogical approach that evaluates student progress uh, in the mastery of specific and measurable outcomes or competencies. It's basically saying, can you do this? Can you show us that you can do this? That's the basic idea. And CBA, which is competency-based assessment, is the implementation of assessment within that environment. So I'm mostly gonna just talk about competency-based assessment but it's in the context of competency-based education. Now, let me ask you a question. It's time to get interactive. What do conventional grades mean, really, relatively speaking? What is a 74 versus a 76? Can anybody tell me you got 76, you got 74. What's the difference? Very little. That's good to answer. Very little. Can you be more specific? Two, two marks, yes. Okay, good, good answer, Joel. And, and that's probably the, the best answer you could give because <laughs> you really can't say much more than that. Now, what's the difference between somebody gets 60 and 80? Somebody's gonna say 20. <laughs> well, and you could probably say the person who did, got 80, well, they, they kind of know their stuff, they're pretty good. But 60, well, it was minimally okay. But if I asked you, what can they do? What do they know? You wouldn't be able to tell me. Not sure if the student would be able to tell me. I, I, I got a 60 once or twice in my undergrad. I didn't understand anything in those courses. <laughs> I got bad hard marks. And we don't want that. Students who pass first year courses should be able to do stuff. They should be able to minimally do what we need them to be able to do. And that's what this is about. So what do conventional grades really measure? And I was kind of getting to that. 
But there's another nuance to it. If you've ever run, done a final exam, there's a mix of questions. Some are easy, some are medium, some are hard. It's a mix of difficulty levels. So if you got 63 at the end of the term, what can you do? What can't you do? Who can tell that? Nobody, nope, and no. <laughs> um, and, and when you put, when one puts the questions these, the, this way, it's like, well, then why do we do assessment the way we do? And I don't know the answer to that, but I've got a better answer and that's competency-based assessment. But before we get there, one last question. What are students focused on in conventional assessment? What are you focused on in your courses? Getting good grades. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Typically grades. Yep. Yep. It would be nice though, if students were focused on learning and you're not encouraged, you've been trained to focus on grades, but we wanna train students to focus on learning and competency-based assessment does that. So these are the core principles of CBA. And I say, these are the core principles of CBA. After lots of reading, after lots of experience, after lots of discussions, after meeting colleagues across the world and across Canada on this topic, this is sort of my distillation. So if you don't like it, it's on me. Um, you won't find a paper or any document with these five, but what you will find is any literature on CBA will have these elements somewhere in them. I call them something, something slightly different, but these are common elements. Number one, assessment is focused on learning outcomes. For example, I want our students to be able to add multiple two-dimensional two force vectors together. That's a skill. Can our students add multiple 2D force vectors together? That's a learning outcome. We want them to be able to do that. We are going to assess that skill. We're going to give the students multiple chances to do that. Competency-based assessment. Learners are given multiple opportunities to show their competency. Number three, timely, high-quality feed, formative feedback is going to facilitate learning between those iterations. So you don't actually, oh, well, this gets to the next one. You don't actually have to be brilliant off the start. We just want you to be able to do it by the end. And that means we got to give you feedback and help you get better if you're having problems which gets to principle number four. Grades are based on where a learner gets to, not how they got there. So if you failed assignment one and failed assignment two and failed assignment three and then got it on the test, the, the module test or whatever, that's good. You got it. We don't care that you took some time to get it. In a conventional assessment system, you get dinged every time. You know, assignments are worth 15, 20% of the grade. So if you're failing those, that's hurting you. If you're failing those, it shouldn't be hurting you. Those are learning opportunities, formative learning opportunities. We do need you to know it by the end, but we don't need you to know it at the start. <laughs> and so if you come in and you have some problem, that's okay. You can stumble and you can pick yourself up. Principle number five, and this is difficult, for some people and mostly professors. Uh, <laughs> performance expectations are clear and transparent to all. I'm gonna give you an example of all this in a minute. And honestly, one of the funniest things we get as a response from some people is, well, if you do that, the students can do well. As if that was a problem. <laughs> so <laughs> we are trying to create success <laughs> and Fairness helps with success. So we are focused on learning outcomes. You get multiple shots at them. We're giving you feedback as you go. You only need to finish strong. You don't have to be brilliant on day one in whatever learning outcome we're talking about. And everybody knows what's expected all the way along. Now, what does all this mean? Let me interpret those principles into something more practical. Again, this is a little hard for some people sometimes. 
in a conventional assessment system, the weights are put on assignments, tests, exams, labs, not in competency-based assessment. The weights, the grade weights are put on learning outcomes. So for example, being able to add multiple 2D force vectors together, that has a weighting, not an assignment. I always know if somebody doesn't get it because they go, but then how much is this assignment worth? <laughs> It, it it depends. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things, but we can say what the learning outcomes are worth. Come on in if you want. <laughs> Learners are often evaluated multiple times on learning outcomes. We try, we try for a minimum of three times on each learning outcome. There's some that we have trouble with that on maybe it's two. Uh, some could be four or five, but typically three is what we shoot for. They get useful feedback rapidly. That helps students improve. That's a challenge on our side. And we've been meeting that challenge. And students recognize that because they know in second year that they appreciate the fact that they got feedback quickly in first year. <laughs> and learners just need to get it by the last evaluation. You don't have to get it on the first evaluation. So there's no pressure to understand it immediately. And that helps reduce the tension in the room. Learners know what they're being evaluated on at every evaluation. We tell you what we're going to mark on that assignment, which learning outcomes. We tell you which learning outcomes are going to be on the tests. That's where some professors go, but then they can do well. But it's fair that they know what they're going to get tested on. <laughs> then they can prepare. <laughs> and they know what they're preparing for. Learners know how well they have to do on any learning outcome. Now this, we've had an interesting uh, marketing campaign for our new first year. One of the major bylines has been no exams, no finals. It, technically that is true, <clears throat> but we actually have a lot of testing. And in the same breath, what we found is that the first year students will say, it's easier because we have multiple chances. If we stumble, we can pick ourselves up. And in the same breath, they'll say, but it's harder because you have higher standards. Because sort of the core material of the modules, they have to get at least 70% on, not 50, not 60, but 70. In other words, to pass the module, to pass a course, you have to actually be half decent at doing those core skills. But you do get multiple chances. You even get what we call top-ups. Even after a module test, if you've failed a, a, a learning outcome, you get another shot with a top-up. So there are multiple chances, but students have, that's what they've found a little challenging, that they actually are held to account. They have to perform half decently. And that ensures that when they go into second year, they actually know how to do the stuff that the professors in second year and third year would be hoping for. An example, a concrete example. Consider a learning outcome where students must add uh, multiple 2D voice vectors together. Deb, you were wondering why I was uh, writing on the board. There, those are three 2D force vectors resulting in this resultant. Now, maybe a student can do this or they can't on their first try, but on the next assignment, there might be a and then they have to get that. Again, same sort of question. Hopefully, as we go along, they will be able to do this. And if they can, then that module test at the end isn't going to be very hard because it's the same type of question. We're not really trying to trick anybody here. We want students to be able to do this. And we're going to give a series of questions like this and practice problems. We might say that this learning outcome is worth 10% of the grade for that, the learning module that it's found in. And we'll have two or three modules in a course typically. So maybe that's worth 10% of the learning module, that learning outcome. Students get three or four chances at it, probably on some assignments and a module test to show that they can do that. They get feedback on each submission before the next submission is due that covers that learning outcome have an opportunity to get help to do better, plus with that TAing in the afternoons. 
if they can't do it initially, it's okay. They can learn from the mistakes and from the feedback and do better the next time. They just need to be able to do it well by the module test and on the module test. And we, we have other models for this, like for design, there's no module test for design. We just have a series of assignments. But the last assignment is well, kind of like a module test. That's where we, you got, you got to make sure you can do it by then on that last assignment. But it's the same across multiple types of courses. What well means is explained uh, through a grading rubric for the learning outcome. And we share that rubric with the students right from day one. They know what they have to do to get that 70%. We have six categories of grades and, and uh, from mastery, developing mastery, competency, developing competency, not yet competent and didn't hand in anything. Um, <clears throat> so we have these categories and you, know, you, you gotta get to that 70% level, which is the uh, developing competency. They also, students know ahead of time when each LO will be evaluated during a module. So they're gonna know, you know this assignment covers these things. That module test covers these learning outcomes. They will know that and they can study for it. Students universally feel that this is a much fairer system compared to, ah, it's final exam time. We're gonna have six questions on the final exam from a possibility of 20 or 30 topics covered in the course. Could be any level of difficulty. Good luck. <laughs> and then after that, what can we say about what the student knew or didn't know or could do or couldn't do? There isn't a lot of research on commonly-based assessment on the long-term effects of how effective it is. There isn't. I'm not going to try and fool anybody here. But I will say this. Uh, having worked in the old system and the new system with similar courses, the quality of the work of students on the module tests compared to final exams in the same topic areas, statics and dynamics tests, is clearly better. For those who are passing, they actually can do stuff. They know what they're doing on the basics, maybe, maybe not on the super hard questions, but on the bread and butter, meat and potato stuff, they're better. I would bet my life on it. So why use CBA? Well, it can reduce learner stress because of the stumble and recover, the multiple chances idea. Grades actually mean something. You get graded on each learning outcome. We can look at our results and say, you knew how to do this, you didn't know how to do that. Overall, duh, 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 duh. we know what the grades mean. It may improve learning because failures, early failures can be formative learning opportunities. And the students who get this capitalize on it. Now we have to help students get that because we're not used to this. It might improve teaching. It may improve teaching because of constructive alignment. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute to show you what constructive alignment's about, but it's making us better teachers. CBA is fairer to learners, as I mentioned before. We know learner skill levels more accurately and more precisely and passing actually means something. You cannot pass one of our courses without having met that composing threshold across the board. Even if you got a 50, it means you did that. So a 50 means you can actually do all the basics. And that's with some mathematic in terms of the, the grade calculation, but <laughs> that, that is guaranteed. It works for more learners with more diverse backgrounds and preparations. They have the opportunity to not be great immediately and to pick it up. And that helps a variety of people in a variety of circumstances. It better handles sickness and lightness. And we learned this in COVID. We were actually worried about this. And it turned out to be one of the major advantages. Somebody's sick for a test. Don't worry. There's going to be a top up. It'll cover the same learning outcomes. Oh, you missed an assignment. Don't worry. It's going to be covered again. Lateness. Comedy based assessment does not handle lateness well because lateness is not a competency. So what do you do with it? Well, you just give them zero. And they go, oh, I got zero. Well, you're going to hit those learning outcomes again. So don't leave it late next time. We've really reduced the lateness on submissions because 
they get their one scare and then they don't do it again. But we can afford to be tough. Learners have choices in how they navigate the system and they can develop prioritization skills. If this is the second or third time we're looking at a learning outcome, say before a module test, then you know what you're doing. Maybe you don't do that assignment because you got another assignment which you got more problems with. You may prioritize things, which is a valuable skill for later, later years. Um, and again, we try to coach the students on this. And finally, another big plus. We can have program learning outcomes. These are learning outcomes that cut across multiple courses, like safety skills for labs in any lab course, for technical communication skills across many courses. It gives the legitimate, valid message that we care about those learning outcomes, not just in a technical communication course, which has been the bane of, you know, Deb's existence <laughs> as an educator. It's like, <clears throat> you know, after they leave this technical communication course, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> it does matter. And we make it matter. And that's why it can be really valuable in building in program learning outcomes. We have them about generalized problem solving skills, tech comm, and safety, and lab skills. That constructive alignment thing, I want to take a moment to tell you about constructive alignment. This is the thing I'm most excited about in education lately. And that is we have learning outcomes and we have learning activities that are focused on those learning outcomes. And then we assess those learning outcomes. And we have learning outcomes that help you prepare for the assessments. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever taken a test and there was a question on that test that you really hadn't been taught how to handle before. Has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, so the assessment didn't actually cover, they didn't tell you what the learning outcome was and the assessment was on something you didn't even know you were supposed to be ready for. How about this? I studied for this one type of question and it wasn't on the test. Yeah, exactly. Has that ever happened to you? Of course it has. Um, you know, they assess something that they didn't teach. They didn't assess something they did teach. This happens all the time. So what constructive alignment says is, what are the learning outcomes? We're going to teach to them. We're going to assess them. And we're going to teach to those assessments. That means being open about what we're doing, transparent. And it means really focusing. We're not going to I mean, we might have a little sidebar uh, story, anecdotal story, but we're, we're teaching you the stuff you need to do the job. We're not teaching stuff you don't need, and we are teaching what you do need. And we're keeping our assessments fair with that. Competency assessment and competency-based assessment, or sorry, constructive alignment and competency-based assessment go together like peanut butter and jam, ham and pineapple you know, Bonnie and Clyde, like they, they really fit together and they make us better teachers. And that's something we're very uh, in, encouraged about. I'm almost done. Any downsides of CBA? Well, I'm not gonna try and fool you. There's a laundry list, but I'm gonna tell you it's still worth it. So number one, it can increase student stress because they actually have to meet standards. And in our case with our system, by and on the module tests. There, uh, there are many formative learning opportunities, but what it really means is that there, you know, there's a lot of stuff to do and a lot of work to grade. And that's hard for, uh, it's hard for the students and the staff in terms of the volume of work. And we're trying to get a grasp on that. Uh, high quality, timely grading is easy to say, hard to do. That, that's a challenge we have in implementation. The system can be a little tricky to learn. I hope I've made sense tonight, but you know, it is a complex system. <laughs> it's not the, this assignment was worth 10%. <laughs> it's not that, it's a bit more tricky. It can be reductionist. This is the critique that's been in the medical education system that, you know, they're just saying, can you do that? Can you do that? Can you do that? Can you do that? You're a doctor. Okay. <laughs> How do we handle that in engineering? Because we want you to be able to do this and do this and do this, but we need you to be able to tie those together. We have a way. 
this is the way <laughs> so <laughs> the mandalorian <laughs> um we we have developed a system that is evolving in a positive direction that addresses this shortcoming so we are very happy about that and joel and i are working on that this summer so that we're going to roll it out in the fall cba does not work on short courses now here's the big test if you guys get this if you understand cba why doesn't it work on short courses like say a three-week course or something you only have time to test them once exactly you don't have time to do that iteration good our dean knows got our dean knows what's going on <laughs> excellent that's why she's a dean uh, so we can't iterate enough we've learned not to do it with short courses no it doesn't really the literature doesn't really tell you that you have to figure it out yourself CBA does not help non-adaptive learners who are having trouble in multiple courses. This has been the biggest bane of our existence in the last two years. Top students, great. You know, solid students, they really like it. Students who are having a little bit of trouble, great. But for students who are having a lot of trouble across the board, it doesn't work. And and we're, we're sad about that, but the, the, the problem is that the students just keep doing the same thing each time. They're not changing, they're not adapting. And we're trying to help them with that, but the, you know, it, it, in that situation, we encourage the students to go half speed. If it's just too much, we encourage, we have a half speed option, we encourage to go half speed. I mean, COVID's been rough on everybody. And students who've gone through high school may or may not, be adequately prepared for university. We, we haven't relaxed our standards per se, but if things didn't work well in high school, you know, how do we cope with that? Well, we got our summer top ups, we've got competency based assessment, which helps. If that's not enough, going half speed can be a good solution. And we do have that. The devil's in the details. This is an intricate system. If we as instructors screw up, uh, like if we designate a type of question incorrectly it can lead to a lot of grief we have to be on our best game so that's a challenge and then finally there's no free lunch this is a challenging system to implement and there you go so continuous improvement we are working on monitoring how things are moving uh, we are surveying first years second years analyzing admissions first year performance we are looking at how others are doing CBA, how we can do better. We are experimenting each year with new ideas and we are changing each year, making improvements to uh, uh, address weak spots, training ourselves, training teaching assistants to do the system. We are sharing CBA experiences and, and lessons across Canada and we're a leader in that regard now, as, as Suzanne was mentioning. Uh, we're working on integrating better with arts and science courses and uh, that's an ongoing process. We have a lot of cooperation with arts and science uh, and, and we're working hard on that. We are striving to achieve more consistency in CBA and constructive alignment within our team. That's gonna be a focus this year. Make sure we're not getting sloppy. Managing workload better for students and staff is a, is a big deal. We are focusing on that as well and improving support before students begin in September. These are our main activities. And in terms of acknowledgements, I wanna point out, uh, Aaron Phoenix was an associate dean academic long ago, and he and I came up with this crazy idea uh, sitting down over lunch one time. Bruce Sparling, um, he's retired now, but he was associate dean academic who, who carried the ball at that level uh, through the whole development process. Uh, our dean, Suzanne Cresta, did the same thing at the decano level. And Deb Rolf is our, our unit head, who was also our defender at that level. So these, these, uh, these administrators really helped us. And Akindale, who is our new associate dean academic, he's, uh, he's been a solid hero for us, and we really appreciate that. Wendy James is the head of the Gwenemos Learning Teaching and Learning Center. She got us onto the CBA thing. Don't blame her if you don't like it. <laughs> we, we've made it our own, but uh, she got us onto this. Ron and Jane Graham have helped fund this, as have the U of S Curriculum Innovation Fund, APEGS, and the Engineering Advancement Trust. 
We want to thank the first year engineering students of 2020, 21, and 22 for putting up with us and, and learning <laughs> with us. And here's the team. This is our core instructional re-engineered team. Uh, Joel's in the audience tonight. Um, so Suzanne, of course, Deb. Um, and then th these are the people who over the last two years have who've done a lot of heavy lifting here uh, to make this happen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rhett. Well, that wasn't bad. It was, it was a little less than an hour. <laughs> yep. But I do want to make sure we've got people that are in the program, people that are not in the program, we want to learn more about it. A couple of students, some parents, um, and so everybody. And we do want to make an opportunity for people to ask questions. One comment I want to make that Sean didn't touch. I'm going to put this on the microphone. One of the things he didn't talk about that as an instructor, I see a big difference. And as somebody who parented two daughters through engineering, um, the way the block registration works is you get put in study squads from day one. And the most important lesson from first year engineering is you can't do this alone. That's like the life lesson that you carry forever. Our students get that by week two, when my daughters went through and when I went through, um, some people didn't get it till Christmas when I was doing it. My daughters, people finally got terrified enough to admit it by Thanksgiving. And I said, you just need to tell your friend that you're really struggling. And lo and behold, their friend was struggling too. Our kids are not, our students are not scared at Thanksgiving. They're just getting their work done. It's a dramatic, dramatic change. And our alumni love this. So they've actually stepped up to fund, I call it the recovery from COVID high performance support person. So we have somebody in the college halftime to help with things like, uh, I feel like really crappy. Oh, well, are you getting sleep? No. Why are you not getting sleep? Well, I'm studying too late every night. How about, are you getting groceries? I don't have time to get groceries. I'm studying all the time and I'm living on granola bars. Okay, so let's reboot here. So we actually have somebody in the college who's available to do that. Life skills, high performance skills. The Husky athletes started this program and they've got 65% of their athletes are using this kind of support now. And our alumni, our 60 and 70 year old alumni, they're the ones that funded this because they really see the value in it. So I think those mental health supports and the student study groups are super important. I just wanted to put a plug in for it. Sorry, Sean. No, I, I, I appreciate it because uh, the study squads, I should have mentioned for sure. I'll, I'll get that in the next version. Uh, study squads are something that the students have noted as being especially helpful. So uh, it was a really, really important point. Thank you. Questions and those about anything? Know. Don't be embarrassed yet. Right. Yeah, I have a, a question. Uh, I'm ready to get you on the ACC certified uh, speed skater. Don't let that affect your answer at all here. Uh, no guarantee. He, he knows I'm a speed skater. Uh, I'm really, really glad to see Because I, I never felt there was a good correlation between the marks that I got. And my understanding that didn't suffer. I never felt that. And and it always bugged me. And I think this is a cognitive basis is a way better at it. But I look back, I, I did engineering in, in the early 70s. And there was much that was not good, in particular the extracurricular activities at, at that <laughs> time. And hopefully we, we fixed a lot of that. Uh, but there were two things that that really I think made me successful in, in my engineering career. One was the first year. We had someone come in, an engineer from industry come in, mm -hmm. and we did design, we actually designed stuff in a competition. Yep. It inspired me, and, and that was really good. And the second thing that I got in first year was a lot of math, a really intense, solid foundation of math. Mm -hmm. 
And I look at your first year curriculum here and I see lots of green, which are stuff that's added in. And if you're adding stuff in, you're potentially taking stuff out. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, is is that sort of, and, and again, thinking about these kids that are coming from high school in, in COVID here where they maybe don't have the background in that. What do you say about the, the strength of mathematics training in this first year curriculum? We're actually really excited about the math training here. Uh, Gary Al, we've been working with in mathematics and he's been totally on board with this for the last five years. Um, we've changed the math courses. Uh, used to be just um, differentiation in the fall, integration in the winter, as if those were totally different and not related. And now they're interweaved in both terms. We teach some basic statistics, um, some basic modeling, graphing, that sort of things that weren't in there before. Um, linear algebra is put in there as well. So it's part of, it's part of the math. It's, it's math, it's not calculus. We have two math courses. You'll notice that the math courses run the whole term, both terms. They're the only courses that do. Um, we have not weakened the math. Um, I will say we are concerned about the quality of math coming out of high schools at the moment. This may be a, 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 an artifact of COVID, but math skills are not where they used to be. Um, and we've been trying to hold the line on math skills in first year. It's been very hard. Like this year was rough. First year sit down tests for students in years for some, but the math content is not being watered down. Um, if anything, we're embellishing it with some nice extras. So uh, your point's well taken. Um, Can I give the yeah. topic top answer? Because I was the person that kept saying, have you thought about this? Have you done this? So the first basic year of design, the thing that makes this all work is the summer top ups. Because instead of using the whole of first year to level everybody out in high schools, right. we're getting them uplifted before they come. Yeah. And it's just so too. it improves the confidence of students from smaller high schools. And it it gets everybody to the same place on day one. Yep. Which I think also contributes to that improved confidence. Yep. Everybody has to be in their top. Everybody has they to do. be those top. Now now they do. Uh, in the first year we did they didn't, but now they do. I also want to talk about the design a bit more because I'm really like designs my my baby and that first design course we're measuring attitudes before and after that design course now and it's way better than it used to be with the design course that we had previously like we're, we focus on problem definition in the fall just that they don't actually design anything they have to understand the problem characterize it and and you know really understand it well and they learn that that's important and they're internalizing that. We're actually measuring attitudes and it's been really, really encouraging. And then in the winter term, then they have this intense course in the fall, which is a design course. They get to make a robot, rocket, whatever. Um, they are getting that. They're getting it at the start and the end. And we have little exercises in the middle as well. Um, it's, it's different, but it seems to be working quite well and the students seem to be enjoying it too so I, I mean i came from systems design engineering at waterloo where you know have a major design course every term throughout your whole time there so i, I love design and i wish we could do more but we are doing as much as we did previously and perhaps in a more strategic way and we're getting good outcomes great questions question. sure how how is it being taken into account for second year students having to go and retake first year courses since first year is modular but second year is full term classes that's an excellent question <laughs> yes that's an excellent question um and it's a complicated answer it kind of depends on what they may have missed and and how much um Sometimes you can sort of make up while you're doing that second year, especially if it's sort of a hybrid second year, because uh, Joel did a great job of scheduling things. So it is possible to take some first year courses while also taking second year courses. Most students do not take four years to complete a degree anymore. They take five or more. And 
what that means is they're spreading things out a bit. And what that means is if they have to make something up in second year, it is possible and we've designed it that way. But if they're in trouble in a bunch of courses, they're probably redoing a, a good portion of first year. And you know, maybe that's, that's not a negative thing actually. So, so I'm gonna jump into the next question. Why is dynamics before statics? Oh. When I took first year, we did it the right way. Statics was a direct precursor to dynamics and it was really hard. How's it working now that they're swapped? It is working great. Uh, we faced some headwinds here in the, in the college about this decision, um, but it is working wonderfully. The, re the reason we switched is this. Students coming out of high school know dynamics. This is not a foreign concept to them. They're learning that kind of material in senior physics. So what do they learn in dynamics here? They learn how to approach mechanics professionally. And it's a little bit harder, but they're learning how to do mechanics more than they're learning how to do dynamics. Then when they get to statics, they're learning how to do statics, but they already know how to do mechanics because they know the system that we're employing. When they started with statics, they had to learn mechanics and statics at the same time, and it was very hard. And 95% of students are liking that choice. So we're really happy with how that's gone. And that came out of deconstructing the learning outcomes and exactly. aligning the courses. So it yep. was a big, I was in the room when that day sort of happened and it was really cool. I want to make sure we catch questions from our visitors because Sean's downloaded a huge amount in a short amount of time. Uh, that's what we asked him to do because <laughs> this will be on the college YouTube channel if you want to go back and pick up pieces and make sure that you understood. Uh, that's part of what we try to do. Where's the closest Other pizza questions? shop is allowed? I'm starving. Could we please finish? Those are good questions at this time of day. I had those thoughts myself. JD, you got... I'm, I'm seeing a lot about a body language called, please don't look at me, um, <laughs> which is just fine. And feel free to poke your hand up if something occurs to you. Confusions are just as good as questions, by the way. Right. Yeah, that, that is another great question uh, for Jay Lowak. How does this first year program affect students as transition to second year? We are asking the second years that this year. And the results have been quite favorable. Uh, in first year, they learned how to handle volume of work. They learned how to manage their time. They feel that for the most part, they learned the content that they needed to learn. They felt well prepared. I, I've had civil engineering students tell me, this has been easy this year. It's practically a review of first year. It's like, this is a piece of cake. Um, so now that may not be sort of uniform across all the students, but the, the, we're getting some good feedback on that. The one area where there has been some discomfort, statistically and anecdotally, is that it's the no final exams thing because now they're writing final exams, cumulative final exams. And it's like, ooh, scary. And we didn't have many of those or any of those in first year. We actually, I lied a little bit. There are one or two final exams for some students. It's in that bridge course because those aren't commonly based assessment uh, courses. So if the Python course and the mechanical engineering course and the chemical engineering course, they do have a final exam. But we, we've got to teach, we've got to coach our first year students a little bit better on this point. I mean, every module test is worth 100%. I won't go into all the mathematical algorithms that we use, but for every learning outcome on a module test, it's either worth 100% or 50%. It's worth 100% if they do the same or better than they've been doing. The no lose scenario. It's worth 50% if they're weaker uh, in their performance. So it's minimum 50, maximum 100. The 100 is if you do well, so that's not a bad thing, but it's a minimum 50. And that can be, it, sh it should be <laughs> somewhat intimidating, except if they know what they're doing, it it's not intimidating. But the, going into a final where you don't know what's gonna be on the final, it's the whole term and variety of types of questions, that 
there has been some discomfort around that. And, and I would that's, yeah. I would poke at the constructive alignment being a gap in those second year exams. Um, that's something I did a lot of work on in my identity before being a dean. And the constructive alignment is a huge, huge piece of the winning story. Yeah. I'm going to wrap it up there. Anybody that does have something that remains unanswered, please do stay. We'll hang around. I want to um, give Sean a gift that I'm sure will be disappear quickly because it seems to have the chocolate. <laughs> I believe so. I believe so. So thanks very much, Sean. Thank you. And uh, these talks are really designed to highlight people in the college that are doing extraordinary things. And I do want to emphasize that the educational scholarship behind the first year program is extraordinary work. And I just want to thank Sean for sharing that with us today. And we, we do take our turns in the first year program, but I also want to be sure to note Joel's in the room and Joel and I did this, a lot of this together along the way. And, um, you know, all the members of the first year team have contributed, all have been vital, but Joel and I were kind of partners along the way. And we, we do take turns doing these sorts of presentations, but I, I want to do a shout out to, so, to Joel. I'll, I'll stare, yeah. I didn't stare. <laughs> Anyways, so happy to answer any questions and thank you for being here tonight.